Hello, and welcome to Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Sinclair, and I'm here with Erica Antelan and Sydney Proctor from the Domestic Violence Action Center. We're going to be calling it DVAC for short for the rest of this show. You know, I'm always looking for respect that we can find somewhere out there in the chaos. And this is where I have found very, very amazing respect and all kinds of opportunities for people that are out there that are in a situation where they need help and they're not sure where to go. You can call DVAC. And so, with Erica, why don't we start with you, okay? Now, you are the sure. LGBTQ. Um, specialist at DVAC, right? Uh, or LGBT. advocate? Yes, advocate. Okay, Thank sorry, you. I didn't quite say it the right way. But, um, okay. And so you can see on screen right now, there's all kinds of uh, numbers that are there for you to call. Write them down. Make sure if you're going to make that call that you do it when you're safe. Okay? Make sure that your abuser is not around because that could, if they found out, could come back on you, right? So you want to make sure you're in a safe place when you reach out and call. And Erica is the LGBT advocate, and then Sydney is our helpline specialist. And so, okay, once again, um, Erica, why don't we start with you, and why don't you tell us a little bit about exactly what you do, what kind of programs you guys okay. have, and maybe even give us a little overview of DVAC to start for sure. those of us, that, for those of them out there that haven't heard about it yet. Yeah, um, well, well, first of all, thank you, Think Tech and Cynthia. It's been nearly almost uh, two years since- That's right, because you were on before. Yeah, for, um, initially when the LGBTQ plus specialized advocacy services first started. Uh, but yeah, DVAC um, is a nonprofit organization that has been around for almost next year, if I can correct it, but for almost 30 years here in Oahu. That's awesome. Yeah, wonderful. And we have a um, legal team on board with the DVAC and advocates. So we pr provide legal and advocacy services. Okay. And then um, part of what I do is specifically I work with clients who identify as LGBTQ+. Um, the program initially started um, nearly almost two years ago. And so we still continue um, to provide services, advocacy and legal services for um, this community. So do you have some kind of statistics or, um, I know we have a graphic that um, kind of helps to show a little bit about the, it's called the power and control wheel or something like that, if you could bring that up. Could you explain this just a little bit for us? Yeah, um, in, in general there is this power and control uh, wheel out there that folks can see, but it's basically where uh, abu the abusive partner will use this power and control to keep their partners, the victims, in the relationship. And specifically for the LGBTQ plus community, there are uh, definitely tactics that are done um, upon our, uh, the victims. What kind of tactics? What are they? Form of they abuse, do? yeah. They're, um, I won't go over all of them, but okay. definitely the first one I would like to share is the, the outing, where the abusive partner will out their partner. You, and there's a difference between coming out if you identify as LGBTQ plus versus um, outing. Outing is when someone is outing you that you are uh, a lesbian or a gay or... Uh, when nobody or, else knows. You yes. mean they are the ones who say it when you're not even maybe ready to Correct. share that yet. And then coming out would be, for example, I came out in my youth years, but I was ready to share with my loved ones. That's okay. right. um, so the outing one. Uh, the second one they, they like to do, the abusive partners would like to do on their um, victims is um, isolate them from their chosen family, right? Chosen right. families could not be not only the immediate, but, you know, um, relationships develop while they were going, um, you know, through their times and still questioning, you know, right. if they identify or not. And that's like a classic thing that all sort of abusive, narcissistic people do is to separate the person they're with from their support system. Exactly, exactly. Right. Thank you for that. Um, and then the third one definitely is um, attacking their identity, right? Okay. You know, you know, everyone has an identity, right? It molds right. over time, right? And and that's how that's how you become your yourself. Um, but being in an abusive relationship, specifically with um, an intimate partner of the same sex or other, um, it it kind of diminishes your identity, right? It gets squashed, it gets right. suppressed, right? 
you're, if you're shy or outgoing, they're going to shame you about right. being shy or shame you about being out, outgoing. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Okay. Yes. Not only that, the identity, but if you identify as, um, uh, um, I'm, I'm identify as a lesbian, so you know, I'm, I'm definitely, um, I'm okay to, to present myself like that and then share that. However, um, with the with the abuser, the abusive partner, they would um, attack that. Um, or if I was going through uh, transitioning and I was a trans man, and they would would, would use verbal abuse and say, um, "You will never be a real man." That's an example. Right. And all of sure. this is just used to exact control over someone else and chip away at their sense of self so they don't feel like they are able to be what they need to be. Right. I think that's the biggest one. And that's mm -hmm. across the board. As an abuse survivor myself, in, in my first marriage, that's where I was. Mm -hmm. I looked in the mirror. I saw fat and ugly because that's what he called me and told me for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I never thought I would have the strength, and I didn't actually have the strength to do it for me. I did it for my kids. And, and that's why I always say to people, I don't care what it takes. When people say, well, you gotta wait till you do it for you. Mm, I don't know if you do. Do it for your kids, do it for your mom, do it for your brother, do it for whoever gets you out mm -hmm. and gets you safe, mm -hmm. right? That's what I always think. Right. So we've got another slide. Um, why don't you bring up slide two for us, and let's talk a little bit about um, sort of the statistics that you guys deal with, yeah. right? Um, so since the program began, we've been providing services to um, our LGBTQ plus clients. Um, this data is from collected from our pro the program, but we report it to the Victims of Crime um, Assistance Grant Program, right? One of our federal funders at the time. And so um, this collects from December of 2017, uh, initially when the program began, um, to April of 2019. So this is just a, de a demographics in Oahu that LGBTQ plus are victims of some type of crime. And surprisingly, there are four top um, ethnicities or races that experience um, uh, some type of crime. And they include, you know, like 20% are Asians. And um, the, the other top percentages um, would be white non Latinos or Caucasians, and then if you see the two two percentage two of the seventeen percentages there, um, there are are populations from the Native Hawaiians, um, other Pacific Islanders, and um, multiple races. Right. Wow, that's a really amazing way they've got it all. Now, this isn't just domestic violence. This is any kind of crime, or is this more specific to? So while they're going through this whole process of you know being in an intimate partner relationship, these are other factors, layers of trauma happening to them okay. at the same time. Yeah, so it's not in the past. Or yes, some sort of possibly maybe um, when they control all the money, so they can't, they don't have a way to get out, mm -hmm. right? Those sorts of things that are now considered a crime, right? Aren't they? Um, yes, uh, fraud as well, right? Where right. they um, manipulate to use their so social security numbers, and you can easily mm -hmm. um, get a credit card under um, their names. Yeah. Right. Okay. So we can go to slide three because I think we've got more stuff here too. Yeah. Just briefly, if this one is that um, the gender population, as you can see, sixty-six percent um, are are females. And they are, you know, lesbians or bisexual as well. And then 20% are males. And then our intersex and other would be 14%. That's a huge percentage for females to be the victims of crime like that. So overwhelmingly more than half. That, that's wild. But a lot of that also might be due to lack of reporting in men or people of other genders because they right. might not feel like they will be accepted or like they should even access services. Right, because there's so much extra shame for men mm -hmm. involved, right, exactly. Right, okay, so our next slide. Yeah. I love all these slides that you gave us. They're yeah, so informative. Yeah, thank you for allowing us to share, you know, information that has been happening to this community. Right. And so this just captures the age groups, right? Uh, what you don't see is zero to 17 is because we have a service within DVAC, CAP 808, that provides services for that age group. Um, okay. with, uh, with the program uh, I'm under is we provide from 18 years to the elderly. And as you can see that 74% um, um, range, the age group range from 25 years to 59 years. And that's, you know, the, 
the biggest population that they are experiencing. Hey, that's a lot of people. <laughs> okay, next slide. Awesome. Well, there's many lists of uh, different types of um, victimization that our, our clients are experiencing. I highlighted uh, four main things, um, as you can see there, that the one victimization type is adult physical assault. And, you know, our clients are experiencing 79% of that. So what's the difference between aggravated assault and simple assault? Ag aggravated would be, um, I apologize. It's okay, where <laughs> yeah. someone is in the hospital maybe yes. or something, yes. where simple assault is where they're bruised and bloodied maybe, but yes. they're not. Right. Okay, I get it. Okay. And then moving on to like the bullying, all of our clients and victims have been bullied right. in, in a lifetime, right? Um, and then they also experience domestic violence in their past history to current with their partners, right? And you can see that 90, 91% experience that. When you say family violence, is it, does that mean that sometimes people, when they come out to their family, they get victimized by their family after they've come out and told them? That's something that... It's isn't? connected, definitely. It's oh, okay. connected to that. And, it, and this family violence can be um, with, of course, family members, not intimate, and then... Um, of course, right? It's, it depends on their belief system, their cultural values, and so and right. they'll definitely go through that type of violence. So you're from Guam. Correct. And is that something that maybe the people that's more looked down upon in Guam? Or, I mean, when you say cultural uh, things, I know maybe for Asian people, they look down on this more so than other cultures, or am I wrong? Um, I might be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I've seen that um, living here and seeing the statistics and also the, the occurrences on Guam is they're kind of about the same of domestic violence and family violence as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so next, we've got another slide. Yeah, um, definitely like to share, you know, working with this community, right, um, it's, it's, we can be an ally to them. We can, you know, help them seek services and so forth. Right. And then um, if you go into the next slide here, you know, we can work around best practices and working and, you know, being an ally to LGBTQ+. And as simple as safety planning, right? Uh, we do it all the time with our loved ones, right? When they go out places, safety plan sure. for this. So um, just let them know if, if you are immediate harm, call 911. Sometimes the victims are so involved in their relationship, they need, you know, uh, to hear this more often, right? So it can sink right. in on what to do. Um, and then, you know, another best practice could be use respect pronouns, right? Because um, some can use she and, and, and he, right. but uh, we have our non-binary folks, right, that don't identify or fall under the spectrum of, of um, using he and she. So we would resort to they, them, theirs, for example. And then you can go online, um, pronouns are, uh, they have a whole chart of different types of pronouns um, folks can learn about, read about, and use, and practice. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another best practice when working with this community or, you know, is um, you can be the support system. Your contact with them may be the only support system they may have when they confide in you, right? right. Share their story uh, about right. what's been going on. Yeah. So always want to make sure you believe the people when they talk to yes. you. Yes. Always respect what they have to say. Mm -hmm. Don't invalidate what, even if it sounds outrageous and it just couldn't be true, it probably is true, and even if it's not, it's best to give them that respect of believing them, right? Yeah. Okay, well, we've got to take a break, but um, I just want everyone to know that this is important stuff, so I hope you will stay with us. We're going to be right back. This is Find Your Respect in the Chaos, and I'm Cynthia Sinclair. See you in a minute. Konnichiwa. Think Tech Hawaii ga Nihongo de Ogri Steimasu. Konnichiwa Hawaii. ホストの国勢ゆかりです。毎週各週月曜日、2時からですね、日本語で日本語で活躍されていらっしゃるハワイのいろいろな方をお招きして、ショーをゲストショーをお届けしています。ぜひご覧になってください。Aloha, my name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at one o'clock 
on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about. Human stories about law and life. Aloha. Hello and welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. I'm here with Erica Antalan and Sydney Proctor. I'm so mm -hmm. bad at names. Did I get it right? Yep, that's right. I'm so glad. They're from DVAC, which is an amazing, amazing nonprofit here that helps people that are in the midst of intimate partner violence. And so, Erica, we talked with you during the first half. Sydney, I'd like to hear a little bit from you now mm -hmm. here in the second half. Tell us more about what you do. I know you're the um, specialist for the helpline, yes. right? So tell us a little bit about what that entails and what you do. So um, people who call the helpline usually have legal issues that they might want information about. Um, we can give legal information as opposed to legal advice because we're not attorneys. Um, okay. And we also do domestic violence education and we refer to different resources in the community. Um, but for victims of domestic violence, we do focus a lot on safety planning and um, giving resources within our own organization, whether that's advocacy or if they need to pursue any legal issues. So when you say safety planning, you mean you kind of go through with them step mm -hmm. by step, make sure you're in a safe place when you call? Yeah, it that. might include an escape plan, um, packing a bag before you leave, or just as simple as if you go to work, can you alert a security guard and show them a picture of your abuser? Can you um, let your kids know that there's a code word if you do need to leave? So it, it's very multifaceted and it's very tailored to each individual person. Right, and I can see how that would be the case. Mm -hmm. So do you work just with the LGBTQ part or are you for the whole entire no, DVAC? No, we... That's for everything, um, right? On the helpline, you can call about any issue. Um, okay. So you don't have to be calling about intimate partner violence necessarily. There could be a problem with like your auntie or uncle, or if you um, have other family issues, then you can always call. And if you're in a crisis, you can definitely call just so that you can have someone to talk to. I know it makes all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and I know everybody out there that watches the show has probably already heard my stories, but um, it saved my life having that um, helpline to call. And this was way back in the 80s when there wasn't a lot of, you know, anything programs advocacy available. But the gal that I called, she really saved my life that time. Because I had been put down enough that I didn't, you know, believe that I was worth anything. Mm -hmm. And that call, just that one call mm -hmm. made all the difference for me. Mm -hmm. And it really turned things around and started me on a different path. And it's nice to hear that nowadays there's a specific plan that you can yeah. go through with people. Back then it was just kind of random, oh, don't worry, you're fine kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, at least you know you're not alone. Mm -hmm. But they didn't really give you the kind of safety planning and specific things like they do at DVAC. You said 30 years you guys have been? 30 years DVAC has been there. That is just, I love that. Um, it, Friedman, what's her first name? Nancy. Nancy, Nancy, Nancy sorry. Friedman. Nancy Creed, Friedman Creedman. is the one who started it, right? She and a couple mm -hmm. of her um, paralegal buddies started just on a lunchtime, you know, having a phone for yes. people. Mm -hmm. And it has snowballed into all of this. Mm -hmm. Wow. So how many different programs do you guys have at DVAC, would you say? Um, five or six. Yes. I would think in operation right now. So um, we have PICO, which is a children a children-based program that focuses on people who are suffering from domestic violence and their kids might or might not be involved. Um, okay. And an immigrant program, LGBTQ, mm. um, our helpline, and then we have our legal team. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Then we That's also a, have, sorry, oh, we no, also have our um, CSAP, which stands for Campus Survivor right, right? Action, mm -hmm. yeah, action pro Advocacy Program. They are advocates who are on site uh, on certain days. And they're available for faculty, staff, and especially um, students, college students. Right. And then we have, many, they're like three colleges now or something, right? Or four? 
colleges now, I think. Um, they're accessible to even um, not the, the CC colleges as well. Yeah, if like HBU, for example, or um, Chaminade as well, if they need mm -hmm. assistance, they can reach out. Yes. Oh, yeah, wow. they can. Have is Chelsea Stewart still doing Correct. that? This, yes. Yeah, I had her on the show. She was actually yeah. my very first person that ever came on my show. Oh. My first guest, yeah. That's great. And then we have our TAP 808. Um, right, program. the TAP yes. 808. And I did a show for those guys, too, yeah. once. Mm -hmm. um, and then so. we have our Expo Outreach, which are based in um, Kapolei Family Court and also Circuit Court along Punch Hall. We have advocates inside if they need help with uh, filing a TRO uh, in that so if someone were to just show up at court, there would be a representative there at court that day for them to be able to? There'll be an advocate. Um, I, I know they have specific times where they go down um, right. on the filing window, definitely. But yes, um, definitely requesting doesn't hurt. And um, if they know about our resources and asking to see if there's any other assistance besides right. um, filing at the window. And so that's something if they had called first, you would be able to say, if they go, mm -hmm. help, I'm going to yeah. court, I don't know what to yeah. do. Yes. I would you let our staff know that they are coming. Yes. And so also it's already sort of set up even and everything, so mm -hmm. they know where they're going when they get there. Yeah. So they don't have to be alone when they go to court. Correct. Yeah. That's a big deal, because I went to court by myself, and it was terrifying. Because mm -hmm. I've never been to court for anything. I never had gotten any trouble or anything, so I had no idea, and the whole thing was so overwhelming and scary. but. Um, and then uh, we have, so, sorry, our last program is our Alaki. Oh, there's one more. Yeah, oh, one sorry. More. Alaki E program as well, right? Which um, one? Uh, Alaki E advocacy program. Um, they, it's a, just the same thing, long-term advocacy, but it's more general, right? If they, oh. these are, you know, possibly um, victims who don't have children, and even we accept the ones with children as well, so it depends. So if they call in uh, our helpline, then um, whoever's listening to their call, we do an assessment over the phone. And then we would do a referral to one of the programs that fit. Um, Basically, so anyone can yeah. call and yeah. we'll have a program that they can fit. Yeah. Right. It's like, hey, my auntie and my uncle are always whatever, or my mom is, or whatever. So and and I, the TAP 808 one is really great because that's for kids, right? Teens? Correct. They're prevention, education work. Uh, and they have an advocate as well. Yeah, an advocate. Right. They, they go into the schools, intermediate and high school. And um, yeah, educate about healthy relationships. Yeah. I, I believe they'll be on on board um, February. I believe next year. I think they're scheduled in for your someone. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. what they they. I was informed. Okay, so they'll be here. Oh, great! I'm glad they'll be here. I, I did it. Yeah, because I did a, a show with them also at yeah. one point. Um, that was a while back too. It was right around the time that I, I did. It's hard to believe I've been doing this this long. I love it because it's just having a chance. It's such an honor. We have a chance to, to share this news with people so they know there's help out there for them. They're not alone. They don't have to suffer mm -hmm. alone. There is help. And that's my dream is to show others that there's hope and healing on the other side of abuse. If I could get out, anyone could get out. So there's, there's help out there to, to keep reaching out. So, okay, say I called you and I said that my brother just raped me last night, what do I do? So we would make sure that you're safe first and foremost. Um, and then we would sort of walk you through the steps of whatever plan there may be. So in that situation, if you had wanted to call the police, if you wanted to um, file a police report or file a temporary restraining order, we could walk you through those steps. Um, and then just go over overall safety, emotional processing, um, and make sure that you were okay and that if you needed to be connected to any outside organizations, that we helped you do that. So what if they're a minor? What if they're not 18 yet? Can you still help them or do you have to go through the parents? Or? That's a great question. So we will definitely talk to anyone who is a minor or under 18. Um, we are mandated reporters, so in certain situations, we will have to tell certain organizations if there's been a crime committed or someone has an intent to harm another person. And something like that would be considered that, right? The person's still at risk, they're in the house with their brother still, so they would need to have that intervention of being a mandated reporter. I was a United Methodist minister for many years, and I was a mandated reporter, and even if I wasn't, just am a mandated reporter because of my own, mm -hmm. you know, feelings of responsibility. 
And I wish everybody was a mandated reporter. Um, that means you'll get in trouble if you don't tell, right? If you know of something that's happening, reach out um, so that you can find out some steps to help that person, right? Because you want to make sure you don't put them at more risk by doing the wrong thing. So it's always best to call and get some help, get some advice from DVAC because these people can really help you. I think it's amazing. So when they call in, the first thing you're going to do is sort of decide where it is that they should call and where they get referred or, or Well, all of that. just establish what situation they're in um, and see what their needs are and mm -hmm. then go from there. So there are a lot of times where people might not necessarily need to um, be involved with advocacy. So we won't do um, what's called a full assessment of the power and control. Um, but right. whatever resources they might need, whether that's a shelter or um, a food pantry or therapy, um, then we can connect people to that. Right. Okay. And then I, I think in the, just in the hypothetical anyway that I was using, you would have to refer them maybe to the Sex Abuse Treatment Center, right? Correct. If it involves rape or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. that's what you mean by the power and control assessment that you figure out exactly what that victim is dealing with at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would use the power and control wheel, the tool that we discussed beforehand, um, to assess where the power and control is in their relationship and to see if they're... And to see what kind of risk factor they have in going forward. Okay, wow. I can't believe how fast this always goes. <laughs> I, it's like there's so many more questions I have, so many more things that we need to talk about. but. I can have you come back and you guys can tell us more about what's going on yes. the new programs. You guys have like 10 new programs from last <laughs> yeah, time. Eight or nine. I go to eight or nine. Yeah, okay, just eight or nine, not, not 10. Erica, thank you so much thank for coming. Sydney, thank, thank you so thank much you for, for having us. It was really great having you guys on the show. Thank you for having us. Well, you guys, this is Finding Respect in the Chaos, and I really hope that you will always know that you're not alone. There is help out there. Don't stay silent. Reach out and get the help that you need. I hope you found something useful on the show today. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii, and I hope you'll join me next time.